Thank you for being here for my session. The music was very soothing. It almost made me fall back asleep. <laughs> so I'll try to do my best. I also have a bit of a cold, so I apologize for my voice. So I'm Andrea Barizani, and I'll be talking to you about our uh, USB Armory project. How many of you know what the USB Armory is or heard of it? OK, good. OK, so thank you for being here, even if you uh, already have an insight on what it does. So just to give a little bit of a background of, of uh, what, what we do, every, every two years or so we try to come up with some exotic research. All of these have been presented here at T2, which I'm very proud of. Uh, um, in, back in 2007, we, were one of, we actually did the very first car hacking talk about injecting traffic navigation messages over cars. Then two years uh, later, we did some very exotic Tempest uh, attacks where we could sniff keystrokes from the power outlets. In 2011, we did uh, a research about chip and pin. Uh, and two years ago, we di presented about uh, packet in packet attacks uh, on Ethernet. And this year, for a change, we decided to build something rather than to you know, hack and destroy all the things, just for a change, because it's always uh, nice. And I'm very happy to present here at T2 uh, the, I would say, the final and ultimate talk about the USB armory, which I think that now has reached uh, full maturity. Uh, in relation to uh, the software uh, that we've been uh, developed. So I'm very happy to give this talk here. Um, so this is the USB Armory. Uh, for uh, all of you that haven't seen it, you can also see it in person later on. Uh, you, you can just you know, uh, come and see it. Um, so what is it? Uh, it's a um, small Linux-based computer in the form of a USB uh, dongle. And it's a completely open source uh, design. And the reason why. Uh, we decided uh, to build uh, this device was that the first need that we had is that we wanted open source encryption that we can keep in our pocket. That was our first uh, uh, goal. Because you know you can get a lot of USB devices that they provide like military grade encryption, whatever that means. Uh, you have no idea what they have inside. And most of the times when we do audits on these kind of devices, their security can be completely defeated. So um, there's something that you know they cannot be trusted. And of course, there are also expensive pieces of equipment. So we thought, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could have something that I can keep in my pocket and that provides me um, you know, encrypted storage, which I uh, know what it does. Um, and also, we wanted some advanced feature. Uh, for instance, you know, uh, if we would put some more, uh, you know, uh, arbitrary capability on such a device, you can, you know, scan for malware or viruses, uh, whatever it's being copied on the device, and you can scan on the device itself. You can encrypt it, uh, and so on. So this was uh, one of the first goal, first ideas to have this very simple device that would emulate mass storage, uh, and that it would do this uh, underneath. But then we thought, you know, if we put a little bit more horsepower in such a device, if we actually put, you know, a proper CPU uh, that we can, you know, flash with our own code, then maybe uh, why emulate mass storage? We can maybe just emulate Ethernet over USB and have a more rich interface uh, with the device that would allow us to do uh, much more, uh, such as, you know, not only encrypting and scanning, but also maybe sharing the file uh, and so on. So. That was one idea. And then we said, but if we have that kind of network connectivity, uh, uh, and if we have this active device, then we can also do a lot of exotic things. Like you know, if a fail-safe word or a fail-safe action is detected, so if I copy a certain file off on the device, we can do data self-destruct, uh, for instance. So features that were nowhere to be found in any other commercial or open source har hardware um, at uh, the time. Uh, and then if we have network, we could also use it as an SSH proxy, right? I go to a kiosk or a box that I don't trust. I will SSH to my USB device uh, with a password, which is either one time or a throwaway. And then my keys are on the device itself. And then from there, uh, I can SSH to my servers. So uh, why not? Uh, we could have a password manager on it. And, and also, uh, very interestingly, um, we can have authentication token, but one of, of, of the interesting uh, functions w w is that we can have the device itself authenticating the host that it's being connected to. So not only you authenticate the device while you connect to it, but you also have it the other way around. So if you connect this device to my laptop, it will work and show me my porn. Uh, if it will connect to your laptop, it will show you a picture of a kittens. Okay, that's that's one idea. Or it will just decide to uh, data self-destruct if it's connected to a device 
uh, that is not yours, or maybe launch nmap and metasploit and other stuff. Well, and it, never mind. It can also be used for offensive <laughs> stuff, um, of course. So all of these were ideas uh, that uh, made us realize that having uh, a generic purpose open source computer in such a form factor uh, was uh, very, very uh, appealing. Um, and also you can have other features, you can have a VPN on it, you can have a Tor endpoint on it, you can have a Bitcoin wallet and so on and so on and so on. So uh, when we came out with this idea, uh, we set up very early some design goals. Of course it must be a very compact device, I want, I want to be able to keep it in my pocket. So. Uh, you know, things like the Raspberry Pi or the chip computer, they are small, but they're not that small that you can, you know, easily keep them in your pocket at all times. So we wanted something about, that was really, really, really tiny. Um, it must have fast CPU and a generous amount of RAM. So we wanted something that not only was a bit of future, a bit, little bit of, you know, future proof, but also that had, you know, enough power to do not only what we thought we were going to do with it, but also uh, what we didn't know we were going to do with it. So, and you end up always needing more power and more memory. It must support secure boot. So it must have a way uh, to validate the code which is running on it, which is signed, and it's signed with your own keys, not with inverse path keys or anybody else's keys. It must provide standard connectivity over USB, so something that can be easily used. And very important, it must have a familiar developing and execution environment. Uh, we audit embedded system for a living, and, and there are a lot of systems where just getting the developing environment working uh, takes a lot of time and it's very fiddly. And usually, uh, that learning curve, even if we're not talking about rocket science, uh, kind of make people go away from that platform because it's very annoying to use. So we wanted something that was super easy to develop on. And it must have open design, both uh, hardware and software because you know otherwise when you talk about security uh, it makes little sense to have something which is closed. The first and most important step into doing such hardware is selecting the system on a chip that you're going to use uh, because when you commit to a design it, it's very important to make the right choice uh, especially when you are a very small company and you do such open source hardware you don't have a lot of budget uh, you, and you're not going to make millions of units but you're going to make thousands uh, it's very important not to make mistakes in order to do new rounds of, of revisions. Um, we selected the Freescale IMX53 because we did audits on this specific system on a chip it is fast enough for our needs. It's a Cortex A8 CPU, which, which can go from 800 megahertz to 1.2 gigahertz, which I think for a USB dongle, it's pretty fast. Almost all data sheets and manuals are public, and there's no NDA required, which I think it's a very good thing. The data sheets are OK. They're not great, uh, but they are OK. Um, and we have a good ARM trust and support, secure boot, secure storage, secure RAM. There was, there's a detailed power consumption guide available, which for us was very important, because when you plug something into USB port, you gotta make sure that it doesn't drain too much current or your port will shut everything down. And there's excellent NETI support for Android, Debian, Ubuntu, even FreeBSD, and so on. And there's good stock and production guarantee. You don't want to commit to a design and then find out one month after that, oh, sorry, we're not making that stock anymore. You cannot order it because that sucks so much. So this stock is gonna be produced until 2020, I think, so. That's good. It has a lot of features which we just don't use and don't power up because we have kind of a, a bit of an extreme design, but you know, it's a, it's a fairly um, you know, complete system on a chip despite its age. It's not a, a very, very, very new one. So I mentioned that this uh, SOC has Truston support. So what is Truston? So Truston is a technology that is used uh, in pretty much probably every mobile smartphone that you have in your pocket, and, but at the same time, uh, it's not a very approachable technology. There is not a lot of good tutorials, documentation about it, not a lot of the frameworks, uh, but it does play a very important role. And what it provides, so think of it, of, about, uh, think, think of it as a, like of a lightweight virtualization, which is not really virtualization, but it's like separation of two different execution contexts. So, so you can have a non-secure domain uh, where you run your normal Linux uh, you know, uh, OS with your user mode applications, your privileged kernel operations, and, and so on. And then you can have a completely separate execution context, which is called the secure world, where not only you can have, it can have its own user mode and its own privileged mode, but you can also decide to assign specific hardware subcomponents just to this domain. So think of it as a hardware firewall. Uh, you can decide to have, for instance, the micro SD card or the USB uh, driver or, and so on only visible to this area over here. 
And the way from going from switching to one context to another, it's very clearly defined with a very specific path, which is where you're going to put all of your code that kind of uh, you know, audits the way these two codes are being called. And one of the other motivations for developing this hardware uh, was to provide uh, a platform that can be used to experiment and develop uh, with uh, ARM uh, trust. And so for instance, uh, use cases for this uh, are oh, secure user input, because what you can do and what we do in, onto this board uh, is that you can decide to assign the LED, for instance, only to the secure word. So if you see that the LED is on, you know by design that the secure domain is running at the moment. So if something is asking you for a password, for instance, let's say for encryption or decryption of the micro SD card, if the LED is on, you know that the normal world is not phishing you. So the USB armory concept uh, is kind of shift uh, the uh, concept of a live OS, right? We're not plugging a USB storage device where you execute an OS on your laptop from your USB storage device. We do something further. We do the execution on the actual USB device. And this provides a further level of separation so that even if you don't want to trust your rich OS on the USB device itself, you can have another little container where you can run more lightweight applications. So um, the um, um, one of the um, use cases for this is that the, in the normal world, you run a rich OS like Linux, and in the secure world, you run very basic uh, security applications. Um, so, you know, kind of like a smart card, which, however, you can define at runtime by, uh, by software. And you can decide to assign half of the RAM or whatever amount of RAM you want only to the secure container and then do uh, cryptographic operations uh, and, and other things in, in that little container. And if the normal world is breached or if the normal world tries to access hardware that is not supposed to access, then you can trap and detect uh, and all of that. It also makes very good for malware analysis on ARM because with one single instruction injected into any uh, kernel space program, you can jump directly to your code in the secure world and the secure world can inspect all of the memory and register and so on and everything that's going on here, it's frozen. So also for debugging and uh, reverse engineering, I think it's, it's also pretty, pretty handy. So eventually, so we made this hardware, it's completely open source software and open source hardware and uh, these were the final specifications, it's very very tiny, uh, uh, power consumption is well uh, within the range of uh, the USB current that you can get, we have our free scale stock, uh, we have trust and we have a micro SD card slot where all the code gets loaded from, so there's nothing that you can flash on the system on a chip uh, code wise. Uh, so everything gets booted directly from the micro SD card, which is good because it's something that you can control. We have a fine pin uh, breakout header uh, with GPIOs and serial port here um, that you can use. And we put the LED specifically also for secure mode detection with, uh, with Trustum. And we have native support from Debian, Ubuntu, Arch Linux, uh, Void Linux, Kali Linux, uh, and you know uh, other distribution, and which uh, is, is pretty good. Um, you can emulate any USB device at a very low level and the USB controller on this uh, system on a chip allows a very, very a great degree of freedom in manipulating and playing with USB. So it's also very good uh, for penetration testing. And it's completely open hardware um, and open software. So uh, this is an interesting thing. So we specifically designed the device to work in device mode. So it's a USB device that you attach to your laptop. But after developing and producing the hardware, we realize that we can also put it despite driving the USB ID pin to ground, which usually prevents the USB controller to change the role of the device, but we can also have it in host mode. Uh, so this is a picture from the very first attempt of putting it in host mode. So what we can do, we can reverse the role of the USB port. Uh, of course, you need a, a special kind of connector because you need to bridge a male uh, USB plug to a female one. But what you can do, you can use a USB power hub uh, you can feed the power back into the device and then you can attach a USB keyboard, mouse display, there's a Wi-Fi dongle here and this acts as a completely independent computer so you don't even need a host to access it and it just takes one file to switch between uh, the two modes on the OS that you're running on the USB armory. So instead of then say, telling people to just do this kind of very awkward breadboard uh, setup, uh, so we created an adapter uh, for it which just bridges um, 
two USB female ports, uh, and then we have power. Um, also, nice uh, side effect of doing this is that this, we didn't put any data traces from the power to the two USB female ports, so you can also use this as a, as a safe charger uh, for two uh, USB devices. And unlike other solution, everything is exposed, so you can actually see from the traces that data is not there. Not unlike some of other devices where you have an enclosure, so you don't know what's inside. There could even be another USB armory inside, so that was a nice side effect that we only realized afterwards. And so with this, for instance, you can also attach a battery here, a USB power battery, and you can, you can get like eight hours of running time, uh, you can immediately get, uh, you know, Tor access point, boom, done over there, just, just like that, uh, with everything open. So at the end of the talk, if you ask interesting questions, I'll give the host adapters away uh, for free. I will just throw them at you. So think of some questions if you want to. <laughs> Okay, so, um, and, and this was a very interesting use case that only popped up after we'd done the design. So, but luckily, uh, again, the USB controller is very forgiving, uh, and so we were rushing. One day we did the adapter and we had a completely new uh, use case uh, for it. So now let's talk about uh, developing this kind of hardware. So, uh, developing this kind of hardware is very difficult because you have, there were at least two components here which have BGA form factor. So BGA means ball grid array. Uh, which means this is the stock, this is the RAM. The way you solder this, you, in, in this case, you have 529 little, very tiny steel balls of 0.8 millimeters of diameter. Um, and I mean, maybe very good people can solder this by hand, but, but we cannot. Or if you do, uh, you always make a mistake, or there it goes, 200 euro of prototypes, let's try again, oh, that's done, and so on, and so on, and so on. So it's very hard to prototype this manually. So we said, we're clever, Let's, be, let's try and be clever. Let's create a prototyping board. Okay, so, so this is how it works. So when you have BGA, what you do, so you have your pad, so the pad is the red one. So this is where you have this, where the actual ball gets soldered on. And then what you do at a 45 angle degree, you do a trace and then you have a via. So a via is a hole that goes through all of your PCB layers and allows you to attach that trace to another layer because you know, if you have your connections on the outer ring of, of, the, of the sock, you can just route them out straight. Or if you are here, you go 45 degrees and you go out. But then when you are on the third level here, what you're going to do? You, you don't have any room. So you do a via, you go down to another layer, and then you get out. Um, and when you have a sock like this, what the manufacturer does, because otherwise you need 62 layers, uh, all of the uh, pads in the in the middle of the sock they are usually for power and ground, so you don't need you don't have any signals there. You just connect in two planes where you have all of the power. Um, so what we did we did a breakout board where we would break out every single connection of these. So we've done these boards in the past for some reverse engineering, but never for for a sock with this with this density. So we did this very cool board where not only we would break out all of the connections, but we only make it so we don't have to solder anything. Because if you, two of these boards, there are a lot of layers here, cost uh, about 800 euros. And we bought this very expensive socket, uh, custom made, 1,000 euro, which allows you to clamp the system on a chip without having to solder it. You get a, a precision, a torque precision screwdriver, you clamp the system on a chip, you also, uh, you also don't have to solder uh, the connector, you can just screw it on. And this connector, uh, this socket, guarantees the, the frequency ranges that you need for operating the device. And this way you can break out everything. So, you know, we, we were very confident, very cool, this is awesome, we're clever, we're super awesome. Now the problem, uh, so this is, this is a, a graphical representation of what happened. So I was the admiral, I was, uh, sorry, I was Darth Vader and my colleague Andre was the admiral, which it's like, you failed me for the last time. And then I killed him, and which is why he's not here, because he's dead. Because, so what, it, what we tried to do, when, when trying to assemble all the power components for powering up the sock, so you have like eight power rails of different voltages, uh, and this is a power regulator that enables all of that, the tolerances for the distances between the inductors and the resistors are so tight that no matter how good you are at putting things together, out of eight rails, one will not be stable. And then you cannot power up the sock. So we're like, you know, this is not gonna work. So we need a PCB for that. But if you need a PCB for that, you might as well put the sock on the PCB. And if you do that, you might as well put the RAM on the same PCB, 
and the micro SD card, and then you have your armory. So the bottom line was just go for the first alpha prototype and it's gonna be fine. So that, and, and we wasted you know, time and money in trying to be clever, so lesson learned. So this very nice prototyping board is like a superstar destroyer. It's something big, expensive, that looks cool, but then eventually falls on a planet and is being destroyed and is completely useless. But it's nice in the office to have. <laughs> Everybody sees, oh, you've done that, it was very clever. No, never worked. Okay. <laughs> so, second challenge uh, was to use, uh, you know, you make an open source hardware. Now, if I release the designs and you need a 20,000 euro tool to open them and modify them, it, it is open source technically, but it's, you know, it's not really nice. So we said, let's use KiCad, which is an open source software for developing hardware. So KiCad, is, it's fine when you do simple stuff, but when you do something like this, it's a huge pain in the ass. And, and the, the problem here, the, the, the main issue was that when you have to uh, connect the memory, the RAM, to the SOC, all of these traces, they need to be exactly of the same length. This tool doesn't provide any simulation, which also means that when you go from one layer to another, there are a lot of empirical rules which tell you what's going to be the contribution of the via, but you never know, right? They will tell you, I don't know, it's going to be maybe multiplied by three if it's the same layer, and if they're different layers, you just don't know because the layers, they don't also don't have the same distance between each other, right? So it, it, it's a mess. So we had to do two things. First of all, make sure that all the transition between layers were exactly the same for the data addresses and control traces. And also, just to be on the safe side, because remember, uh, this is a side open source project. We don't do this uh, for a living. Uh, we matched every trace to the third decimal point of the millimeter. Um, and KiCad doesn't provide you any helpers in doing that. So this was all done manually. <laughs> yes. And, and also, usually when you route these things, you can route on this side and on this side. You can do a lot of light swirly lines to match the length. Here we could only go straight. And you would expect that the way the connections on the RAM are aligned with the SOC, that they're like match each other, right? That you go from here to here and so on. No, it, it, it's a complete mess. They, they don't talk to each other. It's not a free scale talks to my corner like, oh, can you put, please put those pads in this order? No. So, you know, it is hard enough to figure out the way to connect these regardless of the length. And then you're like, okay, now I gotta match the length. So, uh, you know, uh, huge pain. Uh, and this took us two weeks, opposed to a professional PCB master with a professional tool would do this in probably one day. So that was just for the sake and the love of the open source community. But I'm never gonna do that again. <laughs> okay, so on the other hand, KiCad has excellent 3D viewing capabilities, which are useless, but you know, it's nice. You get to see your board before, before you print it, which I guess it's fine. Okay. So this was the alpha board. So alpha board, you gotta put some test point because if things go wrong, you wanna be able to debug them, but at the same time, you really wanna test the form factor of the device. Because all, this device is about the form factor and it's about violating every single possible hardware recommendation that your components gives to you. Which is like, oh, please put this distance. Nope, sorry, I cannot do that. Because I'm making you know, a computer in a USB device. So what we did, we put a JTAG connector here, but we made it so that we, if you really wanted to, we could cut all of these two sections and they would, they would still work without, uh, without any problems. Um, of course, JTAG works if the SOC power is up. If the SOC doesn't power up, which was our biggest fear, because remember, we didn't manage to power it up with our uh, awesome uh, breakout board, uh, then, okay, you have test points for the power, but then it becomes really complicated to understand uh, the nature of, of the problem. But as an inspiration to you and to make open hardware, luckily this worked the very first time. So that, that was good. Uh, so JTAG eventually wasn't really necessary, but it was cool for making pictures, which are better. So, you know, that was, that was nice. Um, and, you know, despite me bashing KiCad, I think that nowadays being able with completely open source tools to design something like this, which is more powerful more, more powerful than something like this, I think it's pretty, pretty amazing. And this is just a CPU, and that's a full-blown uh, computer. However, Dark Vader prefers the Pentium 2 because it's black and more menacing, so we decided to make the board black as well, rather than green, because green is, is, is very boring. Um, so we did our alpha board, 
we made two, which is very stupid. Don't make two boards. That doesn't make any sense. You get a PCB panel, just use it all. But you were stupid. They both worked, uh, which was good. And then we made, with one PCB panel, we made uh, six different betas with the same run. So when you produce hardware, you pay tooling costs. And every time you change your design, you have this cost, which is a one-time cost which gets added because you change the design. So by doing uh, six different revisions in the same panel, because one panel would hold six different boards, uh, then we had one tooling cost for doing six different versions. And the point of the betas was to lower down the cost of the device. So we would be less and less conservative in the way we, do, we would power up the RAM, for instance. So we have a version which is not the final one, which has m even less components, but it would draw a little bit more current. So we thought you know, to spend that extra euro for each board and have it a design which was a little more elegant. Uh, and out of these betas, then we picked up the design that actually made the final version, uh, which is uh, the Mark I. Um, lessons learned while developing this hardware. We had some inductors that after just three weeks of taking gently the board and putting it on the table, they would just break and fall off. And it wasn't because they were in solar correctly, but because the actual inductor was very, very fragile. Um, and it's very important to figure these things out because before you make 2,000 of these. Okay, very, very important, Cru crucial step. Uh, and then so we changed the inductors that we used and we found TDK inductors which uh, have a nice hexagonal shape like the notepads in Battlestar Galactica. They cost less and they consume less power. And you see that when you make hardware you get excited about these things, which is a curse. You get excited about this tiny inductor you can find. Oh, it's awesome, I found this new component. It's, it's don't do hardware, uh, it, it, it rots your mind. Um, Second problem, very interesting problem. The beta boards arrive, we plug them in, and before booting, we have a delay of exactly five seconds, every single time. And we're like, what's going on? So when that happens, what you're gonna do? You search for every single data sheet, because five seconds is a very precise timing, right? You're not gonna magically put some inductors there that randomly will just enforce five seconds every time. So you search for every data sheet for the words, five seconds and you will find it. And what it turned out is that the power regulator has a five second delay, enforces a five second delay when you have an under voltage detection. And so we're like, why do we get an under voltage detection? Because you know, we're doing something weird, we're powering the CPU over USB, it's, it's kind of you know, um, interesting. So what happened is that uh, since we asked for, uh, for this contacts to be gold plated, because if you're not gold plating them after 50 times, they will just not work anymore, the manufacturer added these traces here for depositing the gold. So keep in mind, these were not part of our design, of our Gerber files. And when the board was cut to make the connector, you get four little tiny conductive dots over here. So what happens is when you plug the board in, you get a connection, and then for the distance between the edge of the board and the actual pad, you get no connection, and then connection back again, every time you plug it in. And this very split second was causing the under voltage detection. Um, so very interesting problem, not induced by our design, uh, and very difficult to debug, because now it's easy, now it seems obvious, but this took three days of, of wondering what the hell is going on. Um, and including you know, putting duct tape over here to see, is that it? And then yes, oh, that was it. Um, so for the final version, the uh, gold deposit happens with these four little dots over there, which are safely outside the board edge, and we don't add any, any, any traces. So this is the final design. Well, no, this is a beta, but uh, I didn't have time to take pretty pictures of the final design, but it's identical. Um, we have our header, we have RAM, we have our SOC, and everything else is power related. So there's nothing flashable, no code running on, on every other component. And we have our microSD card um, on, the, on the opposite side of the memory, which is also something that you should never do, which also creates a lot of problem in routing uh, the RAM, but you know, we managed to fit it there. And I'm never gonna ever change this SD card slot ever again, because just changing this, which in other design would be very easy, here it's, it's, it's a mess. We have trust and support 
in GNOS. So GNOS is a microkernel-based operating system which has some interesting concepts. So if you want to play with Traston, now there's official support and it will just boot an empty secure container, but it provides a nice way uh, to just uh, play with Traston. And what it will do, it will run your normal Linux kernel, minimally patch into normal world, and then GNOS will just uh, be as an hypervisor um, over there. Now, secure boot. So, the SOC that we chose and supports what is called High Assurance Boot, HAB, which enables the verification of a signed boot image. Now, very important, this is very different from the secure boot that you have on a normal PC, because there are no keys from the manufacturer inside. The keys that you put on the SOC are your keys, and you can put up to four public key hashes um, on it. And this uh, secure boot mode cannot be reset. So if you flash your keys and you lose your CA, you get a very nice and expensive brick. It's not like a PC where you can reset it. And this is a feature. It is not a bug. Because here we're talking about a device that you carry in your pocket that you can potentially lose. And you don't want other people to be able to reset the device uh, with debugging mechanism. Up to three keys out of four can be revoked, which also means that you can play some nice tricks, like you have your three keys, which are valid, and the fourth is completely random. So you can have software, in case of something wrong is detected, revoking the first three keys. And since the fourth is random, you also get a brick. So it also provides some nice defensive capabilities, uh, so to speak. Um, the way Secure Boot is enabled, so basically, uh, you can also do it from the OS. But this is an example from the bootloader. You just fuse uh, the hashes for your keys, and then you lock them. Lock means that uh, if you fuse a 1, it's automatically locked, because you fuse bits. If you fuse a 0, I mean, somebody else can replace that 0 into a 1 unless you lock it. So you need to fuse and, and, and lock it. And once this is fused and activated, the system on a chip will refuse uh, to boot uh, any bootloader uh, which hasn't been signed with one of your keys, or the ones that are not revoked. In combination with U-Boot Verified Boot, uh, so Verified Boot allows you to embed a public key into the U-Boot image that you compile, and that key is going to be used to validate the Linux kernel. So this way, we enforce uh, the, the chain of trust. So the system on a chip holds your keys and validates the U-Boot image. The U-Boot image, which is now validated, embeds your public key, which is then used to validate the Linux kernel, uh, and so on. So this is now possible with this device. And we have uh, all documentation on our wiki, and it's relatively easy to, um, to do. And all of this is done with user control certificates. There are no EM certificates, no Microsoft certificates, no inverse path certificates. It, it's something that uh, you control. Uh, so this is an example, successfully booted, uh, sign you boot image. Uh, when it boots, it means that it works. Uh, and this is a failure, but shown in verification mode. So before actually activating the final bit, which tells enforce secure boot. Because when you have a failure with the feature active, you get nothing. You don't get any serial debugging. You get nothing. The SOC just refuses to do, to do anything. So this is uh, just for testing. Before you fuse that final bit, you test it, uh, that everything uh, works correctly. And this is what verified boot looks like. So the bootloader. Uh, computes a SHA-2056 hash of your kernel image, uh, and then verifies uh, that the hash has been signed with the public key, which is embedded in, in the actual bootloader uh, itself. Now, in this, this year, between March and now, so March was when the hardware was, was available, we went into a journey to, to enable all of these features, like uh, documenting secure and verified boot. Uh, it's not something that takes a day. It's something that took a lot of time to, to do it reliably and documenting in a way which was easy to people to access uh, and not to mess it up. Because again, otherwise, you end up with a lot of little bricks. But also, one of the things that we wanted to do, uh, we wanted to publish at least one application that would implement the vision that we had for this device. And the application that we developed is called Interlock. All uppercase, because NSA, right? So the, the official name is all uppercase. Um, and it's an open source file encryption front end, which is developed but not limited to the USB armory. So you can use this on Raspberry Pi, on whatever device that you want, even your desktop. 
And what it does, it provides a web accessible file manager uh, which is tied to a uh, Linux unified key system protected uh, encrypted partition. And we can also enable additional symmetric and asymmetric encryption on stored files. Um, we provide uh, open PGP support in a way which has safe defaults and provides little control to the user for all of the gory details about PGP which makes PGP difficult to use because that's the problem for most people. When you use GPG, it's a pain in the ass. We have symmetric ciphers for doing symmetric cryptography. We, can support, we support uh, TOTP tokens, so you can have your Google Authenticator tokens backed up in this interface. And now we recently integrated messaging, so we have text secure and signal uh, interoperation uh, between uh, this, yeah. <laughs> so now I'm gonna demo all of this. Um, let's see if the demo gods are kind to us today. Okay, so I have my USB armory attached to my laptop. First thing that happens when I connect to Interlock, Interlock asks me my laptop for a certificate and it's gonna validate the certificates. If the certificate is not valid, it's not gonna talk to me. And if you wanna do more stuff, like if the certificate is not valid, nuke everything, it just takes two line of codes in patching the Interlock sources, okay? So first thing, it, the USB key validated my client. Now we're presented with a login interface. So two things about this. So we have a volume name, so you can have more than one volume, of course. My volume is Armory. And we have a password. The password can be disposed of after use. So if you're worried about keystroke sniffing on, my, on the laptop or PC that you're connected to, you can have more than one password tied to the encrypted partition. You can have 10, you can have 20, and you can dispose them right after use. So if somebody is interested in now my password, if I, if I tick that checkbox, the password is not gonna be useful for decrypting the contents of the, of the drive if somebody steals the drive. If it's the last password, goodbye encrypted partition. This is a feature, not a bug, again. As soon as you log in, so these credentials are tied to the encrypted partition. We don't have another file where we store credentials, okay? The partitioner unlocks, and we have a file manager where I'm just gonna show you how difficult it is to upload a file over here. So the most difficult thing will be handling with, with Windows and removing, okay? So uploading a file is, so okay, I have a file here. I'm gonna delete it. This is all happening on the device, by the way. This menu here, it's the web application and it's doing actions on the device. Uploading is as difficult as, oh, drag and drop. Okay, done. And this is up being uploaded on the encrypted partition. All of this here is the encrypted partition. Once I have files on here, I can decide to encrypt them again with either a symmetric cipher or I can use OpenPGP. So I se select a key and then I just encrypt the file and now I have my encrypted file. And then I can download the file if I want to. You can generate an open PGP key here. And you can also import, of course, keys. Now, very important, so the keys are stored on the encrypted partition. And while you can, uh, you know, view, uh, encrypt, and decrypt, uh, everything is a file. So every file that is here benefits from all the features that we have. So this is my key information. I can download the public key. I can also uh, view the, the public key. Uh, private keys can never ever be downloaded through the API of this application. Now, if you enable SSH on the Armory with a completely different authentication system, of course you can connect and you can get them, but from the API of, of, of this web application, uh, you, can, you cannot get them. Um, you can also compress files. Uh, you can move, you can do all kinds of things. Uh, everything is audited, so here you have a nice log which tells you everything uh, that's going on. You can add, change, or remove passwords for uh, the encrypted uh, storage. And if we go into the tech secure directory, so here I have a contact file, and I can just do, 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 do. what's happening here. Oh, demo fail, why? Ah, uh, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna fix that. This is probably some internet connections sharing issue. So 
This is the armory. I'm SSH to it. So if you're in Windows and you don't want to virtualize Linux, you can just SSH to your USB device and you get this very nice and cozy Linux feeling back, <laughs> which for me, for me, it's very nice. OK, let me restart interlock. OK, okay tech secure. So let's see if it works. Just got to remove airplane mode because I didn't want to get disturbed during the presentation. Actually, you know what? I'm going to do something else while this gets connected. I'll also show you how to share a file. So I have a picture here. I can just copy. I can go to the contact. And I can send it. So now I received foo here, which is the message that I sent. And now I should receive a picture. After my phone catches up with all the notifications that I had. Come on. Demo gods, don't fail me now. I'm obviously routing. The, there you go. So now it's loading, and you see there's a picture of a cat. Lovely cat over here. So, thank you. And of course, if I reply back from my phone with a typo, I get a notification there. And here I get. Hello with a typo. Heli, which is kind of Finnish, right? Heli, right? Okay. So what's important about this? This is really important. You can share files not only with mobile clients, but you can also share files with other instances of interlock. And we have an easy way of encrypting files and sharing them with one click, which means no more PGP and email clients, which are a pain in the ass. We can just piggyback on the tech secure signal infrastructure to share files between other USB Armory clients, or USB Armory and mobile clients, or mobile and USB Armory clients, in a relatively easy way. And I think this is really important in making encryption and file sharing very, very easy. So now with my colleagues, the way we share files, we always have our USB Armory in our pocket, with all of our encrypted files and repositories, uh, and we can share them with this. And also by using a library directly, we also have much less limitations than the mobile client. You can share a 50 megabyte file easily uh, with, no, with no problems with this. Uh, as soon as you log out from the application, the encrypted partition is locked uh, and you cannot access it anymore. Um, this is, um, all of this application is 4,000 lines of code. The presentation layer which you see here in the web, is completely separated from the actual backend. We have a JSON API between the two, which can be easily audited, it's well documented, and it's, we don't use any web framework whatsoever. We have a single static Go binary with only one dependency, which is optional, which is the tech secure library if you want to enable it. So the goal was to have minimal code that can be easily audited that would implement this kind of very uh, rich functionality, uh, but without uh, you know, the burden of complex dependencies and, and, and complex code. Uh, and again, it, it doesn't need to be used only on the USB armory. You can also use it on x86 on your laptop anywhere, uh, anywhere you want. But for us, it was specifically designed to allow using the USB armory very, very easily. Uh, and the Ethernet driver uh, is already there on Mac, uh, Windows, and Linux. So if you have a DHCP server running in the USB armory, you plug it in and anybody can access interlock without ever knowing uh, you know, what Linux is and, 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 and so on. So we really wanted to make it um, super easy. What we also did, um, we created a build root environment. So build root is a, a framework which allows you uh, to compile and customize embedded images very easily. And with just these two commands, you can compile an embedded kernel which has a minimal root file system on it and has the interlock image on it. And the root file system image is embedded in the kernel and it's a RAM-based file system. 
Why is this? Because with secure boot, I can sign my bootloader, and the bootloader can sign the kernel and root images at the same time, and everything else is the encrypted partition. So this way, you have 100% chain of trust coverage of all of the code that's being executed on the armory. Because the root file system is being signed along with the kernel, cannot be modified. If you reboot it, it will be reset. And it will only expose uh, interlock, uh, which then allows you to access your uh, encrypted partition. There's only one set of files that we write outside uh, the RAM on a separate partition. And those are the TLS keys for interlock, which are generated uh, at the very first attempt. So what you can do, you can launch this image at the very first time. It will generate the HTTPS keys. You don't connect to it. You take the micro SD card out. You mount it on your laptop. You import those certificates in your browser. And then you, you can trust uh, your armory. This was also very important to make it easy. We didn't want, of course, to ship our own TLS certificates with Interlock because that doesn't make any sense. But at the same time, we don't want normal users to have to fiddle with OpenSSL and create a CA and self-sign them. It's a pain in the ass. So we included in Interlock the capability of automatically generating ECDSA uh, certificates at the very first attempt. They're generated, they are binded to the IP address that you configure the armory with, and then you can import them in, in Chrome or your browser, and then you have that trust. Because doing opportunistic encryption with uh, HTTPS, it's impossible. Uh, because the problem is that even if we would generate random certificates every time, then you get a big warning on the browser. And every browser developer will tell you that you should not educate users into ignoring uh, warnings, which is why opportunistic encryption on browser is impossible nowadays, uh, which is, I think it's a big failure of HTTPS. Because we thought if we do that, it's better than no encryption, right? It actually turns out that it's not the case. It is better than have no encryption than having encryption with randomly generated certificates every time with a browser, which I think is a big fail. Uh, so what we do, we do tofu, uh, which is time trust of first use, okay? Which is kind of like what you do with SSH when you trust the fingerprint uh, the first time. And this is why we generate certificates um, into this way. Um, now, once you compile this image, what this image will do, and I'm going to do the second demo. Wow, lots of demos. Okay, So I have another armory here. So we have also binary releases for this if you don't want to compile them. So you can go on our uh, interlock site and you can download either the files or the micro SD image. So provisioning the armory with this is as easy as taking the image and do DD or win disk image on the micro SD. And that's it. You don't have to know anything else. And we set it up in a way where at the very first boot, the encrypted partition will be created. It will be resized to the size of your micro SD. And uh, the keys were, will be generated and so on. So now I've done this on this device. And here I also have my signed bootloader and so on. And let's see if it works. So this is, I'm going to show you the serial console output. We have you boot, which means you boot was signed. This is the kernel verification the image boots. Now it's creating uh, the, the logical volume. The, the LED is blinking while it's doing this. As soon as the LED doesn't blink anymore, you know that this has been done. So it's also good to provide feedback to the user. Uh, we're creating uh, the file system. So this is a 32 gigabyte micro SD card. So this will take um, a minute. And again, this is to show you that we, tr we try to make it easy. Like a user that doesn't know any of this will just plug in now, and now it's, 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 it's up. And interlock is now running. If I, I can plug it out because nothing has been mounted yet. Now, watch carefully how fast it is while booting. So I plug it in. We have the two seconds to give you a chance to debug. And the kernel start, and it's done. <laughs> so on my Windows machine, it is faster to access this than my, my storage device. So thanks. <laughs> And this way, you can access your interlog from here. You, we have default credentials. You can log in. You can change them. And you have fully open source software and hardware and encrypted file system where you can also do very, very advanced things. We think that these kind of hardware devices nowadays are really, really important given the times uh, that we live in, it's, it's very important to have something that you trust. It's also very important to have something that you can carry in your pocket when you're done, so that you also mitigate the evil made attack and, and so on. And we think it's also very important to have something which is now based on x86, which we know 
uh, it's, you know, it's a bit complicated and problematic security-wise. So we think that we, all of the path that we've taken into develop secure boot, verify boot, into develop being interlock and the hardware, um, and we also develop an enclosure so that you can, you can take this and put it in, in, in your pocket uh, quite easily. Uh, we think that uh, at the end of the day, the project was successful and our vision was, was implemented. And we're also very honored to see people that, people that are using it for all kinds of purposes. Uh, people are using it as a Tor uh, router, VPN. Uh, the, it can be used as an HSM. You can plug it in the back of a server and then do all the HSM functionality uh, with a much more powerful performance uh, within this device. And since you're free to provision it with your own software, you're not confined within uh, the bounds of the firmware that the manufacturer is giving to you, uh, we think this freedom can enable very, very uh, cool applications. So I thank you very much for your time, and now I'll be very happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. OK. Um, yes, um, how about updates? I mean, uh, well, we have this image, and uh, you can just put it on the device, but why, why, when you want to upgrade the software, how will that be done? Uh, you mean the interlock embedded image or in general? In general, I mean interlock. If, if you want to update, up, update it. You get the micro SD card, you yeah. mount it on, on any micro SD reader, and then you just replace the file. So yeah. all of that is one file. Yeah, but still you have these signed, signed things, they are signed and everything, so you have to do some... Yes, in our wiki we have all the procedures uh, that you that you you got to use to sign them. Yeah. So, so you're not kind of like, uh, you have this version and it's final? No. no, when you involve signing, the, the difficulty level raises a little because you have to sign them. We're not going to give you our own signed images, right? Yeah. So if you're not signing them, it's as easy as just copying a file. If you have to sign them, uh, you know, it, it, you get a little more. But, you know, uh, it, 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 it has to be like that, yeah, you know. Absolutely. If it's too easy, it can be deceived. You got one? Oh, oh. oh thank you. OK, so I want a way to store my uh, PGB keys. I yeah. have GPD in here and I Kinda, well, fuck it. I don't trust it. So, <laughs> I want something to that can emulate smart smart cards, like right. pro and PGP. Can this do that? Yes. Why would you do that when you can run GPG on this? Well, that's kind of true. Where you can never ever expose your private key to the memory of your host. Yeah, right? Because what the YubiKey does, yeah. when you touch the YubiKey, you will unlock the key that has been used to encrypt and decrypt that message. And that key is going to be fed into the RAM and into the execution constant context of your laptop. Yeah. The whole point of this is that all of that get on the actual USB device. So with interlock, you don't have to do any of that. And with interlock, you don't have even have to deal with GPG code, because everything is done in a much simpler way in Go code. So to answer your question, you can do that. Yeah. You need to write your own software. There are already HSM emulator and uh, PKCS whatever emulators, so you can. We don't provide anything ready, but there's nothing that prevents you from doing that because uh, this just acts like a Linux server. But you know, I would just use GPG directly on it or interlock. Yeah. Do you provide any uh, PGP UI? You you had something. Yes. But this actually might be. The most easy thing. What we provide is what interlo interlock allows you to do. So you can import keys, you can generate keys, and you can encrypt, decrypt, verify, and sign. So within the boundary of the defaults that we have, you, you can do that. And hey, pull requests are welcome. What's the most common arm? Not common, but what's the most common arm that you find out? Cool way to, right. to use this device. So some people are using it for audio, which eludes me uh, as, as, a, as a use, but they are using it for audio. And they're also using it as an embedded uh, hardware for other kind of industrial automation things, just because they find it convenient to have such a defined block of hardware that you can attach over USB to other things. So if you want to offload security capabilities of, of any hardware, and you have USB, and you have a host which is capable of loading the Ethernet emulation driver, it gets really easy uh, to do that. And a lot of people like the fact that it's not like a smart card where most of the time it's locked like the YubiKey. You can never change the software on the YubiKey, even if you could, if they would give you the key 
which we don't know who has it and if it's really random, by the way, uh, they really like that kind of degree uh, of freedom. Uh, I'm gonna, on, go on good faith, I'm going to give you one right now. <laughs> so it better be a good right. question. I hope so. <laughs> uh, you spoke many times about putting that or keeping that in your pocket or whatnot. How many devices have you lost to static electricity or other you know, mm -hmm. bad things happening in or near your pocket? So we do have one component on it which provides ESD protection for the USB, uh, for the USB port. We never had a single ESD event so far. We had one failure which might be ESD, but I don't think it was. But uh, the fault rates d due to ESD so far, I would say, are, are non-existent. Of course, you must take precaution. The enclosure helps. Uh, but if you're in Finland and it's minus 20 outside and you don't have an enclosure, just don't touch it outside, I would say. Yes. Uh, what prevents you from uh, taking out the SD card, inserting it in a second USB armory, and uh, with, a, with signature verification disabled, and then you get basically unlimited attempts at uh, trying to read the password because it, it it will not be able to reset itself. We, which password are you talking about? Uh, for example, the one to the login screen that you showed. Um, okay. So the login screen, so first of all, there's nothing that prevents you to change in the code and allow only two attempts or to nuke everything after the third attempt, right? And nothing prevents you from having uh, a large password. And also, as I said, uh, it validates the host. So if I lose that and you take my armory and you boot it up, that server will never talk to you. So what you can do, you can get the micro SD card, you can mount it somewhere else, and you can try to do a brute force attack on that. But that is exactly identical of what I would do with your laptop. If I steal your laptop and I have your encrypted partition, that's exactly the same scenario. So it's a good question, but I don't think it's relevant to this specific use case. But you mentioned that it can disable itself on some conditions. Can you still take out the SD card, insert it in a different yes. USB armory and boot it? You can. Um, then, then the disabling actually just disables the hardware. But yes. Then you can just Correct. It, but correct. There it is, is no secret inside of the that, chip that yeah. can be used for encryption. That that's correct. There's nothing that prevents you to taking the micro SD card out. However, there are some very advanced uses that you can do. There's a symmetric secret which you can um, you can complement with your own in the SOC, which is unique per SOC, which allows you to encrypt content yeah. only for this specific device. So if you combine that, you also get a setup where. Uh, if I take the micro SD card out, it doesn't work, and I will I need that specific device. We are not publishing anything about this use case because it's a little tricky to do it reliably and in a way for users not to mess it up. But it, but it can be done. And think of this, first of all, this is a platform that we also give to developers. So the capability for preventing this use case, uh, I, I would say uh, it's there. It, it just, we just don't publish it, but yes. I, I understand your concern. And how can you detect that like an attacker steals your USB armory, changes the hardware and puts your SD card back, but then the hardware is different and it, it, it's able to snoop on your data without you noticing that the hardware has been switched? Well, if you use this symmetric encryption functionality, this is mitigated, right? Uh, but you know, one of the other points of this is that unlike my laptop, which I leave in my hotel room, I can keep this with me at all times, right? So maybe you can mark the device somehow. But yes, of course, uh, I will never, as being a security professional, we never say that this is 100% bulletproof and we reach perfect security. But I would say that we selected a hardware and we're doing the software which does as much as you can. And it's definitely much better than something like Tails, which just run in the context of, of your laptop. You know, we just try to, to, make it, to make it work. But this symmetric secret, which is on the SOC, we, we might just publish something about it in the next months. It just takes some time to, to sort it out. Thank you. Yes? Actually, there is a process that you can follow uh, or mitigate that is a threat. And it, that is that you take this um, nail glitter and put that into, the, into your enclosure. OK. And take a photo of it. And every time you use it, you just compare the photo on your cell phone with a glitter on, on, your, uh, on right. your enclosure. Right. Because it creates a unique pattern that you think you're not able to mimic. Mm -hmm. Artificially, so if somebody breaks your enclosure pattern or the yeah the pattern on your enclosure won't match, and okay. you know that it's been tampered with. Okay. You have one already, so I'm not going to.
Yeah, thanks. No, no, thanks. Could you use something like this to plug into like mobile Android devices and put it from there? Yes. yes. And then it, connect back to the Android device in case it's device that you don't trust. If the Android device supports OTG, yes. Uh, not all of them do, or some of them do from a hardware perspective, but the software doesn't do that. So my Nexus 5, unless I root it, it, it will not allow that. But if it does, yes. Uh, we actually tested that, and it works quite well. Oh. Yep. There you go. Oh, thanks. No, you greedy bastard. You can't ask any more questions. Oh! Oh, I have this question as well. I just need that after. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but feel free to approach me anytime, and thank you so much.